Hello, all you wonderful Authors Love Readers podcast listeners out there. I'm so happy that you're here. Before this episode starts, I want to talk a little bit about Patreon. And the first thing I want to say is we have a charter Patreon supporter, Linda D. I'm so excited that we have a Patreon supporter and that she was the one who broke the ice and started us. And amazingly, then we have two more supporters who came right behind her. We have Jennifer S. and Laura D. We hope more of you will join Lisa, Jennifer, and Laura in becoming a Patreon supporter of Authors Love Readers podcast. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why I'm asking for your support of the podcast through Patreon donations. Let me tell you, it's really hard for me to to ask. As my friends would tell you, I'm not good at asking for help at all. The reason that I set up the Patreon for the Authors Love Readers podcast, it is not for me as an individual author. It's strictly for the podcast. I would love for the podcast to become self-supporting because I've been supporting it to this point. The expenses include having the podcasts edited because you'll be surprised to know we talk longer than than you actually listen. And I have a monthly fee for hosting the files because these are big files. <laughs> and what I would love is to have people donate You know, a couple dollars a month would be terrific. Two dollars a month would be 50 cents an episode. It would be a sign of support and it would help defray some of these costs. So that would be the way I could keep the podcast going on and on. And I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Hi, welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast where we delve into the stories behind the stories. We're asking authors questions, some of them fun, some of them serious. And from their answers, you're going to learn things you never knew about the people who write the stories you love. My name is Patricia McGlynn. I'm your host and designated question asker. This week on Authors Love Readers, we have a special edition, 28 Tips Learned in 28 Years in Publishing. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to this week's Authors Love Readers podcast. We're going to do something different this time. This is based on a workshop that I gave for the New Zealand Romance Writers in 2015. At that time, it was called 25 Tips from 25 Years in Publishing. And it was described as a fast-paced workshop with nitty-gritty tips, including items on dialogue, character arc, process, editing, the biz, and hard truths. You'll notice that a lot of these are focused toward writers and aspiring writers, but I thought that as readers, you might get some interest and value out of this. It has been updated because it's no longer 2015, so it's now 28 tips in 28 years in publishing. Okay, let's get started. My number one tip, all writing advice is a buffet. You can pick and choose. You can try something. You can take a little taste of it, decide it's not for you, and leave it on your plate. You can um, experiment with something else and say, wow, this is the best thing I've ever tasted, and go back and fill up your plate. And what you feel like eating right now might not be what you want later. So don't lock yourself into anything. Don't feel you have to take the advice from anybody. Well, except me. Well, okay, no, yes, not even accepting me. Even my advice is a buffet. You just don't want to feel that you have to do things experiment with them. Test how they work within your process. Don't shut out ideas, but also don't feel obligated to follow all of them. So keep trying all the different things at the buffet and see what works and what pleases you. Number two, dialogue is the most powerful tool in your arsenal. In narrative, there's always the reader's recognition of the author, of somebody being out there describing and telling. But in dialogue, it's direct communication from the character to the reader with no filter. That makes it so powerful. When it's done right, the author just falls away and doesn't exist. 
So the reader experiences the character as a real person, and that's what you want. It's also why show and don't tell is so powerful. When you're, you as an author are telling the reader, they have to take your word for it. Now, it, I, I'm a very skeptical reader, so I tend not to like that. Um, in showing, the writer leaves the clues and lets the reader draw their own conclusions. And that way, the reader, because they are putting things together, him or herself, will believe what you're saying. Now, sometimes as a writer, as an author, the reader doesn't take from the clues that you leave the conclusion that you intended. And that's not ideal. I mean, you would prefer to have them do that, but it's kind of cool in a way. It can lead to a whole different experience of the story. Number three, dialogue is not conversation. Real conversation can be about connecting, or it can be about passing the time of day, or having a witness to your life who, by by listening, says that what you did and what you say is important. It can also be boring, meandering, repetitive, inconsequential. Dialogue may not be any of those things. It needs to be compelling. Number four, all dialogue is characterization. Dialogue reveals your character's past and present and indicates the future. From the past, things like age, profession, ethnic background, gender, education, habits, health, financial situation, their backstory, all that can come through in the dialogue. In their present, it's going to show their attitude, their mood, sobriety, subtext, emotion, relationship to other characters, their goal, their motivation their occupation. And it indicates the future because it will convey an intention, which will be the goal or the motivation, and most importantly, what they need. The reader is, as the reader is looking at dialogue, they're always testing it against what's already been said and then waiting to see if the character fulfills his or her goal or intention. It raises questions with the reader. Now, how all this is revealed in dialogue. Vocabulary, character's grammar, the length of sentences, using contractions or not contractions, word order. All of that helps bring this together. Be very careful about using phonetic spelling. Better yet, don't use it. You can express ethnic background through the rhythm, through the use of expressions, through the word order. If you have to do some sort of phonetic spelling, say like for a toddler, use just a couple phrases for a flavor of how he or she sounds. Unless you are Mark Twain, do not do it for the entire book. Avoid those most cliched phrases that are used to indicate especially nationality, I think, cheerio, good on you, mate, faith in Bagora, and whatever you think Americans might use all the time. That's not the way to convey nationality or the ethnicity. Number four, dialogue is individual. People have their own rhythm. You can tape people's conversations with their permission, always with their permission, and listen to the rhythm of how they speak. Do they go up at the end of sentences, even when it's not really a question? Do they tend to come down? What order do they put the words in? Often this is going to reflect their ethnic background, but it can also be job-related, oh, and emotion. It conveys a lot of emotion. Also, people use specific qualifiers and specific phrase. Does your character say, what time is it? Or does your character say, what is the time? Got the time? Half past four? Four thirty? Quarter to five? Fifteen till five? This varies from person to person. Each individual will usually be consistent. And those are just some. There's also phrases like, do they use maybe? Perhaps? Usually? There are qualifiers that most speakers, real people, (laughs) and characters will use the same ones over and over. They don't necessarily change those up. 
So it's ideal to make it so distinct, to make the dialogue so distinct that the reader understands who is speaking without tags. That's what you're going for. On the other hand, dialogue tags, this is number whatever, (laughs) dialogue tags are valuable real estate. Don't waste them. No, I'm not saying to use the dreaded L-Y words or worse, what is referred to as Swifties. Do you know about that? It's named after Tom Swift books. So you'd have dialogue like, this movie will be popular, he projected. I need to resend that SOS message, Tom said remorsefully. I only have diamonds, clubs, and spades, said Tom heartlessly. Yeah, those are Swifties. You don't want to do that. The dialogue is about communication, and action tags add another layer of communication. Sometimes that's a bonus. Sometimes it's vital. It's particularly important early in a story before you've built up emotional context that gives extra weight to the dialogue. I have an example here of how the context of one simple piece of dialogue changes with the action tag. So the piece of dialogue is going to be, I can't go with you now. Example one, I can't go with you now. She tapped her to-do list with her pen. Sample two, I can't go with you now. She cupped the baby's sleeping head and rocked. Sample three, I can't go with you now. She crumpled the tear-spotted letter she no longer needed to finish. Sample four, She looked pointedly at the clock. I can't go with you now. Now, I added intonation on some of those. But even without that, with just the words on the page, those action tags give you the emotional context. Okay, my numbering system has already gone (laughs) kaflooey. I have this as number six, and I'm sure it's not number six, but numbers, we'll say just for the heck, number six, believable character change must be motivated. Now, if you don't have characters who are changing, you're going to have a very static book, and that's not fun to read. You want character change, but it must be motivated to be believable. Number theoretical seven, (laughs) Believable character change is incremental. It doesn't happen all at once. It's very contrary to human nature. Very few people have an astounding turnaround in their lives. If they make a change, they make it in intermediate steps and reach it eventually. Number eight, change is shown in what a character says, thinks, and does. And that's broken down into two parts, how the character thinks, how they say something, and how they do things, and what the character thinks, says, and does. And then as an author, you want to explore the incongruities from one to the other. A lot of times we would think that it would be a straight line progression. They're thinking differently, so they say different things, so they do different things. That's the most logical and reasonable progression. It very seldom happens that way in real people, and therefore it shouldn't happen that way in characters either to be believable. And you're going to have backsliding. Absolutely. It's human nature. So again, needs to be character nature. Number nine. We're being a little theoretical with these numbers, but I'm just saying nine. Follow the rule of three. It is powerful. There was a a Russian figure skater who used to say that she had her skaters do a trick three times. First time for the audience to see it, second time for the audience to appreciate it, and the third time for the audience to applaud it. For writers, the idea is the first time to establish the character's starting behavior, something that's not working well for them. The second time is to show that character beginning to change. The third time is to show how that change will affect the character's ongoing life. So one example I have from a book called Jack's Heart. 
and the protagonist, Jack, has a particular aversion to publicity and exposure. First time he encounters this, the protagonist is taking video for her blog at a surprise party. Jack responds by taking the camera away and deletes everything she has recorded to that point. The second time, this character has a fan of her blog who shows up, and Jack is very suspicious. But the heroine, Val, has an influence on him and keeps him from going off the deep end about this. So this is him beginning to change. Third time, the media, toward the end of the book, gets hold of something that concerns him. And in the end, with the help from his friends, he handles this. He doesn't go off the deep end. He handles it. So that is the progression and the rule of three. Number 10, we're going to start talking about process here. I was at a workshop and was on a panel and the question came from the audience of what did you learn from your first book that made your second book easier? And some of the other authors on the panel were giving very specific information and it was going down the line. It came to me and I said, nothing. I learned nothing in my first book that made the second book easier. Each book is so different. And so creating each book is so different. And that's the bad news, but it's also the good news because for the author, it always makes things different and that makes things fresh and keeps challenging you. Number 11, remember this is theoretical number 11, (laughs) whatever gets the words down on the page or on the screen that day is a fabulous process. Never, ever put some ideal process above practicality. Get those words down. So somebody tells you you should write a certain way, but you're not getting words down that way, throw it out. Number 12, when you're finishing up a session, don't just stop on a paragraph or heaven forbid at the end of a chapter, stop kind of in the middle and leave yourself notes about what you're thinking about what comes next. I do uh, ellipses, dot, 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 and just odd little things, bits of dialogue, phrase or two, dot, 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 he's going to, whatever, dot, 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 get this in, dot, dot, dot. What that does is when you come back the next day and you pick up where you were, you start filling in where those dot, dot, dots are. You're making it into understandable (laughs) a communication rather than these bizarre little self notes. And that will get your head back to what you were thinking when you were ending that session and when you were in that scene and it gets the momentum going. Number 13, there's a great quote I read called creatives don't thrive when they are micromanaged. And yet we do that to ourselves all the time. We're trying to be ever more efficient and to, to get more work done in the same amount of time. You know, we're just micromanaging ourselves to oblivion. So I am taking the contrary stance that organization is not all it's cracked up to be. 14. Cross-pollination is healthy and vital. You know, it's good for marketing, getting, getting out there, getting your book exposed to readers who might not otherwise have seen it, but also in other ways. Don't always hang out with the people who are doing the exact same things you are. Talk to people with different processes. Some of my best friends are actually plotters. (laughs) I'm a total pantser. Get connected with people in different genres, different ways of publishing, different aspects of publishing. So talk to publicists, editors, readers. Talk to people on the business side. You know, this way you will find your own tools and your own ways to work and to keep fresh. Theoretical number 15. (laughs) Now we're going to talk some about editing. As a longtime newspaper editor, uh, I have very specific and strong (laughs) feelings about this. Some people will say that being a storyteller is enough. You don't really have to produce good writing. You can just get by with the story. That's what readers consume. 
They love stories. And they do. They, it's true that they love stories. All of us do. But is that the only thing that you want to do? My feeling is, why would you do that? Why would you do that to yourself or your readers? They deserve both a good story and good writing. And you have the obligation to give that to them. I strongly recommend that you edit in layers. I think of it as the big picture, and that's you're dealing with pace and plot holes and consistency in characters and and believable change over the course of the book and uh, you know all those all those big character arc all those big picture items and then word editing where you're dealing with the and this also called line edits you're dealing with the rhythm of individual sentences and paragraphs and trying to make sure you have the right word where you want it and then looking at typos. So those are the three layers. Edit for each of them individually. Number 17, one of the things I learned, and this was from journalism, edit from the bottom up for typos. It disconnects your mind from the meaning, which you've already edited for in those other layers, and that lets you spot the typos instead of your brain filling in what it, it expects to see. So you need something to, to shake up your brain, have it stop filling in what it expects to see, and to actually see the typos. And reading from the bottom up, editing from the bottom up can do that. Number 18, make a physical change or several before you start editing. You need distance. You need to shake things up. Again, to disconnect your your brain from filling in, automatically filling in. I always use a red pen when I'm editing. I don't use it for anything else. I like to edit on the paper versus the computer because I'm writing on the computer. I'm creating on the computer. So I want the paper to say, okay, now you're editing. I sit somewhere different if I possibly can. I know some people who will wear a hat when they're editing. Whatever change will work for you to remind you, to keep pulling you back, that you are not creating this, you are editing this, you are standing in for the reader. 19, watch for your bad habit word and keep track of them. Many of us have regular ones. I ask the authors on on Authors Love Readers podcast what theirs are. I keep track from what they say because I always think, ooh, I haven't I haven't watched that one. <laughs> I'm going to have to add that to my checklist. So I go through and do word searches through manuscripts for the ones that I know are really bad. And then there's usually one that's different for each book. And you just have to do your very best to spot it. Okay, now we're on to showing emotion and dealing with emotion in books. Number 20 in theory was at a Laura Kinsale workshop fairly early in, in my career, and she gave a piece of advice about writing a scene from the point of view of the character watching the character with the most at stake. You would think, here's a character in a scene who has a whole lot at stake, can lose everything, is... This is their Waterloo, their emotional Waterloo. And you would think that writing the scene from that character's point of view would be more powerful. But if you write it from the point of view of a character watching, then you have to show the emotion. You can't tell it. If you're writing it from the point of view of the character having those emotions, you can tell very easy to tell, very hard not to tell. So do it from outside that character to get the show in, because remember we talked about show being more compelling for the reader. And then if you want to, then you could turn it back around to the point of view of the character who's undergoing this emotional waterloo while keeping the showing and not adding in any telling, no telling. 21. Emotion that is built in thin, subtle layers can be as or more compelling than a huge dramatic scene. When I had the audiobook of Jack's Heart uh, recorded, I kept asking that narrator to dial down Jack's emotion. 
I didn't want him to be coming across as being as aware of his own emotions. And to me, it's more powerful that he wasn't and that he said things very evenly. And it was other characters who recognized the power of the emotions behind those words. (laughs) My theoretical number 22, silence and stillness can be very powerful. Journalists are taught this fairly early, that we're used to responding to each other. Somebody asks a question, people often answer, even when they don't really want to answer, but they they do. And the power of silence is that it does two things. It often draws a response from the other person. If the other person doesn't respond, it ups the tension. So use that in your writing. Number 23, you don't need big love speeches to get across, to convey the depth of emotion. Leave room for the reader's empathy to fill in. Understated can have impact from the context that the reader has built up over the course of the story. Think about the end of the play, the end of the movie, My Fair Lady. Professor Higgins does not profess his love doesn't say everything's going to be different. What he says is, Eliza, where the devil are my slippers? But from the context, we know how much that means. And you can use that. So I have a book called Almost a Bride, and they have negotiated from the beginning of the book about how some things are gonna, going to happen. Now they're at the end, and the female protagonist, the heroine, says of some of their friends who maneuvered (laughs) to help them get back together. This is all dialogue, no tags. She says, ooh, wait till I get my hands on them. Hey, how about getting your hands on me first? Right after we discuss one more thing. Kids, I want six. Six? I'm glad you agree. I knew we'd agree on something without negotiating. I did not agree. I simply repeated what you said. In case you didn't notice, I repeated it with astonishment. Six is a lot of kids. Yep. Also a lot of being pregnant. And a lot of getting pregnant. Well, that's the upside. Tell you what, let's take it one kid at a time. One at a time, six times. Dave. Okay, okay. Deal? Deal. Now, that is deal, that one last word. It's a very small word, but in context, it can have and does, I hope, have a lot of power because this is the end of their negotiations that they've done through the whole book. 24 in our theoretical numbering. Know the rules. If you're breaking them, do it on purpose. Do it for a purpose, not because you don't know any better. The idea of writing is to have clear communication with the readers and to let the readers understand the story without you intruding. And most of the rules of grammar and publishing language are there to facilitate that. So be really aware if you are breaking those rules. 25. A lot of people say that romance is about happy endings in particular. I don't agree. To me, it's getting your characters to the point that they can have a happy beginning. And even in the mysteries that I write, each book brings the characters closer from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. They are in a better position to have a better ongoing life, the main character in particular. Okay, let's switch some stuff in the business. 26, and this is traditional. There are people publishing traditionally and interested in publishing traditionally. And I feel very strongly that no agent is always, always better than the wrong agent. If you have an offer, you can use a literary lawyer. Do not jump in with an agent just because you have an offer. That's like marrying a guy because you want to go to dinner. I've seen too many agents hurt too many authors in too many ways. There are some fabulous agents out there. Be careful. 
make sure you know what you're getting into. 27. What works now won't work later. (laughs) Unless it does, just to mess you up because you counted on it not working later. It's the way of the biz. 28. Hold on to your rights. Get your rights reverted as soon as possible, even if there's nothing to do with them at the time. Having them under your control is always better than not. And holding on to your rights right now in the traditional world is extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. The traditional publishers are trying to lock up all rights of all kinds. They were not as blocked up with the ebook rights before ebooks became viable, and they regret it because, lo and behold, a lot more of the money is going directly to the authors and to publishers. That's never a good scenario. 29. And this goes far beyond publishing. This is for everything. Read every clause of every contract. Do not sign anything you do not understand completely and still realize you might get some nasty surprises. If you have interest, I'll tell you about the class action lawsuit against Harlequin that I was involved with. And that was one of those, we knew what the, I did and he knew what the clause meant, but (laughs) there was still a nasty surprise. That's a long story. 30, read every clause of every contract with the worst case scenario in mind, and then decide if you can live with it under those circumstances. Do not try to tell yourself and do not listen if the other party tells you, oh, we don't really mean that. We wouldn't enforce that. You cannot count on that. 31. Editors will come and go. (laughs) This is particularly in traditional publishing. And I'm thinking they will come and go and they will come and go and they will come and go and they will come and go. I had 25 books with Harlequin Silhouette and I had believe it was 34 editors. Yeah, they come and go and come and go and come and go. Trends will come and go. Publishing houses will come and go. Some writers will come and go. Some friends will come and go. But there are a few of your writer friends who will be there for you no matter what, and you do the same for them. Those friends are not only a personal treasure, they are one of your most valuable professional assets. Guard them, take care of them, and honor them. Okay, we're to the hard truths section. Number 32, reading is interactive. Now, why do I say that's a hard truth? It's because the author cannot completely control what a reader takes from our words. A lot of us, I think, as authors get into it because we have a touch maybe more than a touch of megalomania. And yet, after we've built this world and send it out, you guys, the readers, can reshape it, change it, remake it. So we do our best to guide you, but in order for you to have that most engaged emotional response, the author can't make it an instruction manual. And so what you bring to the reading from your life, from your personality and your experience, including that, you know, what's happening on that day you're reading, is going to determine what you take from what we've written. Megalomaniacs or no, we just have to (laughs) get over that. 33, you can do as an author everything that someone else did that led to fabulous success. And it still might not lead to your success. It's just the way it is. 34. What looks like success to people on the outside might not feel like success to the person whose success you're admiring. I've been a writer for all these years. I've talked with so many writers. I know people looking from the outside think, wow, so-and-so is so successful. And I know that person is sitting there thinking, Oh, you know, if only I could have this and and that happened and if if only I could make this next step and why this other person did it so easily and gracefully and I'm scrambling. So just be very aware what's what's on the outside is often not what's on the inside. 
Number 35, I had a fellow author who gave me a piece of advice early on that shook me and also really shaped a lot of what I think about, especially about success. And I was lamenting that I was not very good at schmoozing at this was back in the traditional when traditional was the only option, and that I wasn't very good at schmoozing the editors at publishing parties. And she said, well, if you changed yourself to become good at that, and you had success that way, that brought you success, then you are stuck being that forevermore. And I thought, ooh, I don't want to do that. (laughs) So I thought it was a really compelling argument. If you change yourself, if you adapt, and it's not really you, and then you succeed, you're stuck. So pay close attention to that and strongly suggest everybody does. Number 36, ongoing theoretical number system. Writing and publishing are two entirely different endeavors. Frequently, they're incompatible endeavors. And as much as you can, you need to separate that. 37, if you are going to write and going into this as a business, as a career and trying to support yourself, recognize that other people in the publishing industry, um, the other aspects of this, particularly in traditional, but there's elements of this also in the indie world. These other elements of the industry do not see the need for authors to make a living. Oddly, they think their segment of the industry should be making a living. And this is from traditional publishing, there was a publisher who flat out said to a room of authors that we should not expect to make a living writing, while in fact, she and and her entire staff were making a living off our writing. So my tip is to cultivate a split screen brain about money. Be a business person, professional, and expect that what you create is worthy of someone spending money on, and that what the readers spend should come mostly to you as the creator while paying those who help you their due. But I also highly recommend to people who are pursuing writing as a livelihood that inside the privacy of your own finances, never, and I mean never, count on any money until it is in your bank account. I've seen too many things go kablooey in this business. You've got to build up a reserve and you don't count on anything until it is in your bank account and then transfer it quickly to another bank account so it can't be taken out. 38. Fear is the greatest enemy of creating, writing, achieving. So screw fear. 39. If you don't write anything, none of the rest of it matters one iota. If you do write something, you've already succeeded. Anything beyond that is gravy. 40. Please yourself. It's the only way you're going to be absolutely guaranteed of writing something that pleases at least one person. So write for yourself. Don't write for editors. Don't even write for readers. Write what you want or need to write, what you would want to read. Then search for the people who also want to read that. 41. Each book is different. You learn little to nothing that makes the writing of the next books easier. In fact, it can be harder, sometimes much harder, but you do learn big things and small. Then you forget them and have to really learn them to write for yourself, to screw the fear, and you have a great time with some of the best people on this earth as your fellow writers. So even though you're suffering with each book doing being different, you have benefits. 42. No one will care about your career the way you do. It's not reasonable actually to expect them to. But that also means do not give up your power to anyone else. Do not let anyone else have the final word over your career, over your writing. 43. Never give up. 
Know what's important to you about writing and use that to make decisions, to weigh your choices. Figure out what is the most important about your writing. After 28 years in this business, I've seen a lot of people quit because of the publishing side. And that happens far, far more often than people who quit because of the writing side. Hold on to the writing. Hold on to the writing. Hold on to the writing. It's what got you started. It's what will keep you going. And keeping on is what gives you a career. Number 44, never do numbered lists for workshops. (laughs) And especially never ever pick a number that you're going to name this workshop before you finish the tips. Because I don't know about you, but there was no way on earth I could restrain myself to 25 three years ago or 28 now. Couldn't do it. But there you have it, my some unspecified number of tips (laughs) from 28 years in the publishing industry. And I hope you as readers might find some interesting tidbits among these. I'll be very interested to hear your reactions and to hear what you think about this. In the meantime, I wish you a week of great and happy reading. That's the show for this week. Hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for joining Authors Love Readers podcast. Remember, you can always find out more about our guest authors in the show notes, and you can find out more about me at www.patriciamclin.com. You can also send in questions to be asked of future authors at podcast at authorslovereaders.com. Until next week, wishing you lots of happy reading. Bye.